I want to um, thank the Center for Asian Studies um, and the Department of Asian Languages and Civilizations for um, their support and sponsorship. Um, for publicity and administrative efforts, I want to thank Eliza Williams um, and Asuka Morley, um, who's not here, um, and Jackie Coombs for arranging the logistics of Professor Cho's journey here, which I think was really okay, yes, okay. Um, and before I forget, I was instructed by Eliza to circulate the sign-in sheet. So um, please make Don't sure forget the pen. There's a pen. Um, so I should also say that uh, today's talk is part of this year's uh, Center for Asian Studies theme, um, Asian Connectivities, Infrastructures, Networks, Mobilities. So earlier this year, uh, Director Kim Oaks was here today, organized a five-person panel on Chinese infrastructure and development. And today, we'll be talking about a different kind of network uh, within the pop cultural context. The idea of connectivity is not something already established, but a potentiality as a kind of an opening that allows for future, yet unseen connections to emerge. And I think this way of thinking about connectivity seems deeply relevant to uh, ways in which popular culture uh, is uh, rapidly evolving today. And this is a subject matter that um, uh, Mr. Cho here will be speaking about uh, in a very compelling way. Uh, so I'm very excited to have uh, Mr. Cho here, uh, who is a Korea Foundation Assistant Professor the Department of East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto in Canada. Uh, her research focuses on questions of collectivity and popular aesthetics in Korean film, media, and popular culture. And she has published very widely in academic and non-academic venues on topics such as Asian cinema, K-Wave, TV, video, and pop music. Her first book, Genre Worlds, uh, Global Forms and Millennial South Korean Cinema is forthcoming. And her current work, which today's talk will be drawn from, theorizes the convergence of platforms, affect, and globalization fantasy in Korean wave contents and fandom. So um, she has previously taught at uh, McGill University and was a postdoctoral fellow at Brown University. After Professor Cho's talk, Professor um, Aaron Espoli will be providing some initial remarks and comments. I'm delighted to have her acting as a discussant um, this evening. Uh, she teaches at the Department of Cinema Studies and Moving Image Arts. She's a filmmaker a writer and an editor who splits her time between Boulder and New York City. Through her research of filmmaking, uh, she explores questions of environmental history, questions of epistemology, and what we can expect from uh, the moving image. So after Professor Esquivel's uh, initial comments um, and questions, we can open it up to a uh, broader audience and you can have you guys chime in and perhaps you can see what kind of connectivities will emerge out of that spontaneously in space. Okay, so without further ado, I want to give a warm, a warm welcome to Professor Michelle Chow. Um, thank you so much for that and um, for everybody who's helped to um, arrange my visit. Um, I am really excited to share this work with you. It's definitely part of a uh, book project that I'm working on. And so I would love to hear your <coughs> feedback um, and you know, any questions that you have. Um, this is definitely a work in progress. Um, I am just going to read parts of the talk um, because I do have a lot of stuff that I want to show you and I'm a little bit worried about time management. Um, so also let me know if I'm like taking too long. <laughs> um, but I actually am going to start off the talk with a music video. So um, I want to show you something and then we will talk more. But actually a quick poll. Um, how many of you are familiar with K-pop in some way, shape, or form? Are fans? consume it a bit? Okay, awesome. Um, uh, I'm kind of debating for management's sake whether or not to show the video um, by BTS called Idol. Um, how many of you have seen it? Okay, a good number of you. All right, so then I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. All right, so we're going to start actually with a different video that um, I'm going to show you actually on YouTube because it has um, 
subtitles that way. by the South Korean hip-hop group MFBTY opens with a shot of an ambiguous space, neither indoor nor outdoor, open or closed, local nor foreign. Where in the world are we? A figure enters the frame, ambling along a loosely packed dirt surface towards what looks like a pile of glowing trash bags, as a child's voice half chants, half murmurs, Pang taro gaja pang bang, let's go ride pang bang. Um, so that's a kind of chorus refrain, which is really onomatopoeic. It's hard to know what that means. Um, after a beat, a classical Indian guitar riff echoes the child's incantations. And responding to the child's call, R&B singer and rapper Yung Mire then begins the song's first verse with all right, all right, okay, pang tiki pang bang ta ham ke. So all together, let's pang tiki pang bang um, as the beat drops. Jump cuts introduce Yung Mire Yoon and the other two members of MFBTY, rappers Tiger JK and Busy, in alternating shots set in a stylized slum, complete with clotheslines and corrugated metal roofing, and another odd enclosure, a room whose walls are covered in black and white graphic patterns and stacks of what look like pipes or plastic tubing. So here you see um, the kind of slum, slum aesthetic. Um, and then this other sort of what sometimes seems to be like music video land, because this kind of um, room setup is often what you see 
in music videos, and they really center the performer by creating this kind of aesthetically interesting frame, right? Okay, so um, a percussive track of vocalized Hindustani rhythm melds into the sonic texture of staccato rap and the repeated onomatopoeic pang tiki bang bang as the video proceeds. Um, Yoon continues the next verse. Chan chan ji hanar chan thang ji kamarhyal kyamilhan nurhwang ne picture, which is actually um, a, the first line of the chan jamun, which is the thousand character classic that teaches um, children in Korea uh, Chinese characters. So there's this reference to a mixed heritage um, that indicates the cosmopolitical tenor of the track. Um, Yun, also known as Tasha Reed, or T, is the daughter of a black American serviceman and a South Korean woman. She continues to reference her parents' Trans-Pacific Union by drawing on the universalist claim of world peace and harmony, as well as hip-hop culture's affirmation of its reggae influences with the line, one love when I do it for my people. Yoon's collaborator and spouse, Jeff Tiger JK, continues with a verse structured by rhythmic repetition as the lyrics string together the onomatopoeic verbs to nod and to run. That's like, the, the whole song is kind of like a sing-songy children's uh, rhyme because it really uses all of these onomatopoeic verbs and words in order to put together a song that doesn't quite require translation because it's actually also mimicking the rhythm that structures um, the song itself. Um, then Yoon's vocal chorus announces the dominant popular form that uni unites Korean sensibilities and South Asian rhythms on the track that is old school American hip hop. Her line, Here Comes That Bass, that 808, <coughs> refers to the Roland TR-808, an early 80s drum machine that's now revered as the source of the signature synthetic bass and percussion sounds of hip hop and electronic dance genres. The video continues through another cycle of rap verse and the bass 808 chorus to link a diverse array of scenes of group spectacle from the explosions of pigment that, um, that cite the Hindu Spring Festival Holi to the elaborate wigs and costumes of a disco ball lit club scene that appears within the enclosed yard of the colorful fabricated slum. Um, owing to Yudmide's authentic, authenticating life story, the video's use of pop images of the global south signals both an analogy with South Korea's recent history of underdevelopment, whose visible traces endure in the persistent US military presence, for instance, in Yoon's Korean hometown of Udeongbu, as well as South Korea's sub-imperial aspirations and its efforts to reorient global popular culture coordinates towards Asia. So here, what I'm pointing to is this kind of um, use of South Asian rhythm to also indicate that South Korean pop music doesn't just speak to kind of your American audience, but it's also um, a popular form that is directed um, at other regions. As an example of Korean artists routing signifiers of globality through US pop culture forms to achieve crossover success, Pang Tiki Bang Bang and MFDTY are representative of what I'm calling K-pop's cosmologic. So my use of this term evokes discourses of globalization, world making, and cosmopolitanism. Yet, I want to more specifically denote the operationalism of South Korean culture industry's claims to both universal appeal as spectacle and the unique ability to localize global culture through juxtaposition, adaptation, and repetition. I propose that this collective, um, that this cosmologic emerges as the response to a historical predicament. Um, that is, to reconcile the collective function of anti-colonial nationalism with the wholesale revision of the positive content of such national identity categories in the crisis temporality of the millennial term. Thus, the cosmologic of Korean culture industries posits a cosmopolitan national identity through the syncretism and spreadability of its contents. So what I'm trying to kind of point to here is that there is a little bit of a paradox about the way that South Korea's culture industries try to brand this sort of pop syncretism. So um, the most kind of uh, exclusively Korean part of this video is how global it is, right? So that's a, a little bit of a paradox. Um, much of the rising transnational popularity of K-pop today has been correlated to the growth of digital distribution and consumption. Over and above its status as a genre of music, K-pop is a media phenomenon 
that pairs transmedia delivery with the cultivation of visible fan communities whose engagement can be registered on globally popular media platforms, especially social networking and video sharing sites. In the realm of live fandom assemblies, performance studies scholar Sukhan Kim has recently written about the complementary forms of digital and embodied presence in K-pop performance cultures. And a key example of this dynamic can be found in the growth of fan conventions, especially KCON, a Korean wave fan convention operated by CJ Entertainment and Media. KCON began as a vehicle for fostering American consumption of Korean wave content, but has rapidly expanded from a single day event in Irvine, California in 2012, to 2018's eight city edition, with gatherings in Paris, Abu Dhabi, Mexico City, Sydney, Saitama, and Chiba, in addition to New York and Los Angeles. What multi-sided events like KCON suggest is not only the broad global appeal of K-pop idol celebrity and cultural contents, but also K-pop's portability as an industry production and distribution model across regional markets. By portability, I mean not only the mobility of digitally distributed contents, but also the porting of paradigms, tastes, norms, and conventions. In other words, new models of comportment disseminated by global media producers and consumers. The largest management company in the K-pop industry, SM Entertainment, mounted SM Town Live, a concert held at the 50,000 seat capacity Estadio Nacional in Santiago, Chile in February 2019. And since at least 2013, K-pop artists have sought to collaborate with Latin pop artists, songwriters, and producers. As K-pop interjects world music and pivots towards new regional markets, fans and observers may applaud a perceived opening to a broader world than merely that of US pop cultural hegemony. Moreover, in the pursuit of new markets and audiences in all cardinal directions, K-pop's pivot to Central and South America, South Asia, and Africa through regional pop music elements constitutes K-pop's own anti-elitist cosmopolitanism, from Bangra to South African house beats to the Latin rhythms that have found chart-topping dominance across the Americas, to pop melodies and song structures sourced from Swedish hit-making songwriters and producers. This is a cosmologic that, attempt, that aims to encompass the world through populist appetites <coughs> visible online in a version of the world indexed by digital platforms. What I wish to problematize in this presentation is this version of the world produced by K-pop's speculative capture of global popular aesthetics, which remains enthralled by me measures of global influence determined by national branding and soft power influence, which I'll elaborate further. However, I also want to highlight the sociality of K-pop's global fandoms, especially the embrace of fan affect as both an embodied, often irrational sensibility of excess and a sphere of pedagogy, knowledge sharing, and communal hermeneutics. And I find myself in a kind of difficult position when I'm working on this stuff because I too am a fan, so I am very cognizant of the need to be critical about the way that national branding and a kind of commercial nationalism works in the case of, um, of the Korean wave or Hayu contents. Um, but I also want to affirm that the relationships that global fans create and forge across these um, digital platforms are real. You know, they, they are substantive. So um, I think that tension kind of persists throughout the presentation, but maybe we can talk about that more. Okay, so MFBTY is an acronym that stands for my fans are better than yours. <laughs> and it's a unit group that Tiger JK explains was prompted into existence by his Twitter followers. Um, so there's a story that, you know, Tiger JK was a little bit down because his, um, you know, he was running out of money and wasn't sure what to do and how to negotiate his status as a kind of underground hip hop artist in a musical industry that seems to be focusing so much on this highly corporatized production of pop music. And so he turned to his Twitter followers to ask for inspiration and they, they came up with this acronym. <laughs> um, however, the other point of connection that MFBTY and this video in particular um, has to the other stuff that I want to talk about today is that um, the video was, can, conceived and, and shot by a director called Lumpins. Um, some of you may be familiar with that name, um, and it's kind of interesting because Lumpins or Lumpins, I think 
is some reference to Lumben proletarian, perhaps, but I'm not sure. Um, but Lumben's production company also frequently creates visual content for BTS. Um, a seven-piece South Korean idol group that seized the attention of North American audiences and industry managers <coughs> since 2017 and remains the most active musical act on social media worldwide. For example, Twitter lists BTS as the most tweeted about group of tw 2018, and the sheer volume of fans trying to access media content of the band has crashed both the Neighbor Be Life platform that enables pop celebrities to live stream to fan viewers the, the Soul City website, when it featured short ads with the group members and YouTube just last week, when the platform froze at the release time of the group's most recent single, Boy, Boy With Love. Lumpens repeats, um, sorry, this is a uh, quick billboard story. Um, Lumpens repeats visual, visual motifs of Hang Tiki Bang Bang throughout BTS's music videos. Examples include the playfully iconoclastic feather pillows that spontaneously combust into poor man's confetti, the banal inflatable figures that also seem to be parroting celebrity attention-seeking <coughs> behavior in the videos, and exuberant explosions of super-saturated pigment. So that kind of like, you know, rainbow effect of colored powder, I mean, this is uh, something that you see in the background of a lot of these videos. Um, this is also uh, BTS's uh, RM in a cameo appearance in the Pang Diki Pang Bang video that I just showed you, so perhaps you saw that, maybe you didn't. Um, the scene that I picked out also maybe shows some of the limits of K-pop's cosmologic in the sense that um, I know some viewers um, were confused by this because it seemed to be a desecration of a prayer rug where I think that in the um, director's intent, it, that, that rug in the back, background is just a kind of abstract signifier of you know, exotic locales. So this is where he's, um, he's on a toilet, and then the toilet explodes into colored pigment again. OK. Um, referential density reaches an apex in BTS's late 2018 signal, Idol which was produced in two versions, the latter of which features a collaboration with American rapper Nicki Minaj. Um, <coughs> Idol is a raucous club track that uses South, the South African house beat, Guam, to weave the sounds, icons, and rituals of communal festivity from across Afro-Caribbean carnival cultures, Korean folk music and dance often performed during Harvest and New Year's festivals, and Bollywood cinema's large-scale group dance. <coughs> with this collage technique, the video links group celebration to the forms of togetherness found in digital cultures, including multiplayer gaming, internet memes, and viral video. Upon release of a teaser for the music video two days before the full single and album dropped, Korean viewers co coined a new genre label, Chosan EDM, to describe what they heard, which was the incongruous mix of electronica and kuba, traditional Korean instrumentation and rhythms. So I'm just going to show you a bit of that <coughs> teaser to give you a sense of what that means. is this kind of encouragement from the audience to the performer. So the Alpsu at the end is definitely a kind of folk um, reference. Um, OK. So but the opening seconds of the full-length version defied all expectations of traditional Korean pageantry, with the group members decked out in suits cut from both Ankara prints against a CG tableau from what looks like the Lion King on acid. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the idol video. Um, we don't. We're not going to watch the whole thing since a lot of you have seen it already. 
And again, this is um, a video that was pr produced in two versions, and this is the second version that's like slightly less popular, and it still has 72 million YouTube views. This is America, another viral video phenomenon from 2018. In alternating feature segments for individual group members, rapid fire match and jump cuts pair with neon colors through a series of outlandish CG backdrops. Um, so I just have like a couple of examples of the way that um, the video is citing other viral video as a way to kind of celebrate the communal nature of this kind of um, mediated spectatorship. So I don't know, I just pulled this screenshot from Baby Shark and sort of compared it to this kind of imagery. So it's not like a direct copy, but there's definitely a kind of referential, referential um, practice going on. Okay, um, and about the halfway mark, the music video fulfills the promise of the teaser video placing a group in an electro electric yellow Korean pavilion in modified Korean traditional dress, taking folk dance steps to whistles and electronic keys. Each of these swiftly woven segments across rap verse, anthemic chorus, and vocal bridge references the BTS multiverse, with the group restaging choreography from no less than 12 earlier singles. This focus on identity as iterative multiplicity also stretches the boundaries of text and work. BTS routinely built album series that add to, remix, or rework compositional themes, and they often release multiple versions of individual tracks, either in different languages, um, so they often um, release separate Japanese versions of singles and albums, or featuring guest appearances by collaborating artists. The group invited Minaj to contribute a verse to a remixed version of Idol and released a comparably edited video that places the American rapper in a pop orientalist setting. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple more slides. So this is actually, um, this is a video of a really popular Bollywood musical number um, from 2018. Um, and so you can watch this on YouTube. It also has um, hundreds of millions of views. And so you can see the kind of direct reference of um, the kind of scenery or iconography or other kind of uh, global distribution platforms. Uh, okay, so the group invited Minaj to contribute a verse um, and featured this in a remix version of Idol um, that places Nicki Minaj in a pop orientalist setting. So while this might sound tasteless, what's delightful <laughs> about the video is the way that Hangul script in a similar shade of electric yellow as the pavilion and Minaj's wig scrolls across the screen behind her. So this setup, so she's placed in the scene and then she's talking to BTS, maybe, through her phone. Um, and then also this is happening in the scene around her. So, um, so it's interesting because the Humbo script doesn't translate the content of her lyrics into Korean. It just takes the syllables and turns them into, kind of phonetically, into <laughs> writing. So, um, so while the par so while parodying the use of Asian lettering as trite Orientalist decoration, the scrolling subtitles also foreground translation and the multiple wor worlds of meaning that overlay in the video image. 
Idol connects world music and internet culture with the kinds of collectivity associated with communal ritual, and thus constitutes a version of the popular that marries folk culture with commercialized cultural production and social media reflexivity. Arguably, the music video presents pure spectacle, yet it also enacts a form of transcultural communion based on the lateral connectivity of digital networks and globalized youth culture. So in what follows, I further elaborate K-pop's cosmologics and its concomitant global fandom in relation to the aesthetics of Idol and BTS's symbolic function at home and abroad. Since their official debut on the South Korean television pop performance circuit, BTS has become accustomed to broadcasting their lives and performing their boyhood as one of their main pop idol activities. Their management company, Big Hit Entertainment, acclimated the members to constant documentation by hiring videographers to produce hum gun bombs or mini clips of backstage antics, music video set, or tour travel footage to generate content for the Hangtan official YouTube channel, um, which, whose homepage you see here. While there is a paradoxical quality to the figure of the pop idol, which is a product of intense disciplinarity, performing rad radical individualism, this tension is often the main appeal of idol celebrity, and it's this exposure of their so-called real lives um, and personalities that truly beguiles the BTS army. So if you see um, under these playlists, the Pangtan Bomb playlist has hundreds of videos, and so this is the repository for this kind of real life content that the group presents to its fandom as a way to kind of cut past the uh, manufactured celebrity image. Um, but as we all know, this is also a really important part of the manufactured celebrity image. Um, this is a screenshot from um, the Neighbor Be Live app, which is another kind of platform that's used to create the sort of um, intimacy or the idea that fans have access to the kind of real person and the real person's life. Um, but it's an uh, interface that resembles a reaction video. It also resembles um, the kind of conversation that you might hold on Skype or FaceTime, right? So the form of this platform is intended to create the kind of um, sensory experience of um, chatting with a friend, right? So. Um, this is an important way that these kinds of distribution platforms are structured. Um, in a video with commercial radio station iHeartRadio um, that was filmed in New York in 2016, um, RM, the group's leader, explains the success of K-pop as a transmedia phenomenon based on what he calls real-life contents. Um, for a North American viewer, the meaning of this phrase might be opaque. However, it has a certain common sense quality in the South Korean milieu, as local jargon specific to the development of cultural commodities through national branding. Um, as media scholar Jin Dae Yong has detailed, the cultural policy position of the state through the Ministry of Culture, Sport, and Tourism has been to actively promote the development of Korean cultural contents for export through state-funded organizations like the Korean Cultural Contents Commission, as well as the tax subsidies and direct grants. Um, so let's just watch this. I think it's a really helpful explanation of what I mean as well by transmedia. So what is um, the transmedia delivery of idle contents? Um, because again, it's important to remember that K-pop isn't just the songs or the albums that get sold, but it's the actual um, transmedia world that gets built up through the multiple forms of content that get delivered um, on different platforms. Uh, I think first, uh, we're doing K-pop, right? And K-pop is a great mix of music, uh, music videos and performance, choreographies, and social media and real life content. So I think when you get into our music, for example, you, you search YouTube and you you can search you can look for our chemistry and the like contents and they and you could look for the like social media and so it's like a really easy for for them to like get to us so I think that's why K-pop is popular and for us I think we're we're talking about uh, we write and produce our music ourselves and we're talking about the young people young people's lives like everyday like like us like you so. Uh, I think there is a specific contemporary characteristic for the young, between all the young people in the world. And 
thanks to our fans, they translate our lyrics and our interviews into their languages. And that's how could they uh, resonate and feel the same feelings with us. And that's why they pay attention to us and the performances. Um, so, based on this kind of statement, we might, we might consider the nationalizing and self-modifying implications of the pop idol's comments. What does, what does it mean that the members of BTS think of their lives as contents, having adopted this mentality through years of training in the K-pop production system? Through what particular media forms and mechanisms does this self-reflexive alienation divest these young celebrities of their lives as contents? And how does the spectacle of this extraction generate fandom as mediated intimacy? So that's really the question that I'm looking at. The notion of life as contents, supported through the ideology of self-production as consumable truth, helps articulate the pedagogical features of a variety of fan-produced media, in particular the reaction video, that is the sort of video that seeks to turn the act of media consumption into a spectacle that can be consumed by another. So it's this kind of like serial production, production of serial consumption. <laughs> um, and it can kind of have this endless um, trajectory. So this is a form of media intimacy that insists um, that the consumption of consumption is both extraordinary, it produces the intense pleasures of fan enjoyment, and entirely quotidian, a form of genuinely popular media use, as the consumption of others' reactions is also a routine and necessary form of communication that facilitates face-to-face -face contact. Um, the, this is a really interesting uh, example of the reaction video that actually does the critical work that I'm really interested in. This is a compilation of other fan reactions that was produced by a YouTuber um, in South Korea to kind of demonstrate the global fan base that um, the group has. And so it mashes up a bunch of individual reactions into one image. And you'll see that the way that this sounds and looks is actually very much like a crowd. So um, I'll just tell you a few seconds of it. production uh, strategizing to make. You just turn on the video and you turn on your, your camera and you record yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but there's something about um, fandom that really, um, it, it kind of calls for this kind of media production or um, it's, it, it's incredibly important, I think, part of digitally mediated fandom, especially of global contents like K-pop. Um, so in my larger project, um, Vicarious Media, um, from which I'm kind of taking these, this, this talk, I examined three main sectors of K-pop's video sphere, which are all disseminated on YouTube. 
Um, so first, I'm looking at the music video reaction and analysis video. Um, second, K-pop related mukbang or broadcast eating videos. And finally, K-pop dance covers are the often communal restaging of K-pop choreography. I read all of these forms as corporeal indices of K-pop consumption that perform the ubiquitous reflexivity that defines social media platforms as sites of subject formation via media production and consumption. While metamedia have been a topic of analysis in fiction, film, and television, as well as reality TV, I argue that social media participation constitutes an immersive, everyday form of metamedia by which vicarious substitution through the consumption of blogs or reactions induces acutely affected experiences of identification. However, in using the term identification, I don't mean to invoke theories of the cinematic apparatus that foreground the suturing effects of realist cinema's formalism to describe how audiences are interpolated by their encounter with media. In other words, in K-pop's intimate, vicarious media, the identification with bodies on screen happens with heightened attention to the separation between self and spectacle, which in turn rationalizes the structure of co-feeling that could be said to characterize fandom as a communal form. On the other hand, my approach stems from my ongoing interest in popular genre frameworks and citational practices of Asian cinemas, as well as scholarship on the affective force of images. Especially in my analysis of BTS's trend media strategies, I read a catalog of references that draws on the affective texture of various sources from boy band genealogies. So um, this image is clearly citing Ed Road, right? Um, to millennial East Asian cinemas, to uh, the romantic narratives of the modern buildings roman, um, which is an important part of BTS's discography. So if you have questions about this, I can talk about it more, but I'm gonna kind of fly by it pretty quickly. Um, okay. Um, as seen in Pang Tiki Pang Bang and Idol, K-pop syncretism today is characterized by multiple layers of reference, by which the industry posits its worldliness or globality, the point that res resonates with fans' own auteurist impulses, which are often expressed in the painstaking curation of images in fan videos, as well as the desire to produce images of their own consumption. Um, okay, so I want to show this quick video of the way that the K-pop industry is kind of pulling in the fan-produced media aesthetic as a way to um, reinforce this kind of intimacy that it's um, also producing through the constant uploading and um, documentation of the idols out in the world or doing things in, in real life. So um, the group, and BTS is not unique, and there are other K-pop groups that do this too, They've begun this practice of actually <coughs> reacting to their own videos. Um, and then sometimes they will film their reactions to others' reactions, so they do insert the fan into this relay. Um, and so you can find actually lots of videos of <coughs> K-pop idols reacting to fan-produced reaction videos as well. But this is a kind of interesting um, example of the way that the group is primed to consume themselves as an image. So. Um, I'll show you a little bit of this. Of, of gifting and sharing and sort of thinking about the idol as this kind of common property. Um, and on the other hand, in the resemblance between the affective excesses of fandom and those of the mass or the crowd. So this is uh, very much a stereotype that's spread about K-pop fans, is that they're crazy or they're excessive or they're um, scary, you know, this kind of thing. And it's exactly the same language that's used to describe the madness of the crowd, right? Um, if contemporary geopolitics are defined by the rise of various populisms, as many political theorists have argued, I propose that media fandoms be understood as part of this zeitgeist. 
Just as populist movements are often harnessed by state power, so too is K-pop's visible global fandom given a central role in affirming Korean culture industry's strengths as soft power assets. However, K-pop's fan cultures also serve to index a widespread condition of alienation, especially for a young generation facing a lifetime of precarious environmental and labor conditions, as well as this kind of media environment that, like BTS, forces young people to uh, present themselves as contents. Because um, this is something, when, when the, um, when RM talks about the specific contemporary condition that unites young people all over the world, I think he's talking about um, you know, economic conditions that um, are daunting <laughs> for people who are looking for the kind of stability of full-time employment. But I think he's also referring to a kind of media condition or media environment that requires that people affirm who they are and that they exist through a kind of constant um, self-production on social networking. Okay, so I'll pause here for a brief note about the rhetoric of soft power, which is something that I have a weird relationship to. While Joseph Nye's framework is notoriously US-centered, I found in my research that the concept of soft power also frequently animates the technocratic approach to globalization that's characterized the South, the South Korean state since the early 1990s, and thus has deeply permeated both popular and bureaucratic approaches to culture industries, especially in a context in which the perceived intersection of diplomatic and commercial ex exchanges is giving such, given such close attention. The rhetoric of soft power is so prevalent that it's even entered into cultural producers' own marketing strategies. One famous example is SM Entertainment CEO, CEO Isuman's rebranding of the K-pop training <coughs> system as a form of, quote, neo-cultural technology. To strengthen this fit for culture industry innovation, indeed to conjure it into being, Lee even named an SM Idol group the acronym for this for his conceptual creation, NCT. So NCT 127, NCT, they all refer to neocultural uh, technology, neocultural technology, which is um, what they are also supposed to be demonstrating. In my involvement in the <coughs> academic communities that have produced scholarship on the Korean wave, I've often found many a soft power proponent, perhaps because South Korean cultural policy is also so invested in the academy as a site where soft power can and should be cultivated. Yet what the concept of soft power cannot account for is the ebb and flow of national consciousness at the level of cultural consumption. In some ways, the outcomes of soft power ascendancy are clear. Since adopting an aggressive policy framework to support creative industries as a privileged economic sector, South Korea has experienced a steady rise in tourism and cultural export revenues. However, the extent to which this increase in consumption of Korean cultural commodities translates into state power is rather unclear. Um, in fact, it was perhaps tested by the deflating outcomes of the US North Korea summit last month. What I would argue is eliminating about the preoccupation with cultural commodities contribution to soft power is the presumption of their legibility, given the mediatized forms in which it's said to register, whether that be YouTube counts, Twitter metrics, or revenue statistics. Media critics like Jerry Dean argue that the media-dependent representation of soft power is actually an empty signifier of the capture of value in the circulation and recirculation of mere acts of meaningless communication, a system that Dean calls communicative capitalism. Further, Peter Seo refers to this condition as, quote, collective speculation in mediatized populist democracy, where the people have increasingly been redefined as sovereign consumers and citizens whose affinities with popular culture, media, and commodities are prime capitalizable assets for industrial and political actors. I agree that the claim embedded in theories of soft power that culture industry's cultivation of media consumption has explanatory force in the sphere of geopolitics does seem to suggest a problematic equivalence of popular media representation and social life. However, this assumption is also a common self-reflexive self condition for fans embedded in digital communities of delocalized K-pop consumption. That is, for fans for whom K-pop is a subcultural space of remote affiliation, rather than a ubiquitous feature of mainstream public culture. Um, you can find actually lots of um, K-pop testimonials that will talk about how powerful K-pop is as a way of you know, building a kind of youth movement and, and this sort of thing. Um, so there's this idea that um, K-pop is doing more than just um, serving as popular entertainment. Um, 
and I'm really interested in those kinds of claims. You know, why, um, why they're made, and how. Okay. K-pop's vicarious media offer multiple forms of in intimacy. First, that of sympathy or co-feeling, or the merging of interior states through um, the spectacularization of fandom's body genres. But they also demonstrate the notion of intimacy as hidden or previously unarticulated connection that Lisa Lowe has recently articulated in her book, The Intimacies of Four Continents. In her text, Lowe uncovers the relationship between colonial bodies, goods, and ideologies, and the de development of liberal thought an intimacy that remains in current international relations discussions of a liberal world order that's now imperiled by resurgent populisms. In the media intimacies that K-pop makes visible, the intimate relations of colonial and neo-imperial relations in the development of popular music coexist with the turning of private experience into private property. Um, this privatization is then paradoxically also turned into common property as it's shared on social media. The proliferation then of spectacles of reaction and the discursive production of media intimacy gives form to the desire to create something like a concept of social totality and the relationship that the public might have to the media text that hails it. Um, this is something that Chua Beng Hwat has called an occasioned community rather than the classic imagined community of print capitalism. <coughs> South Korea's robust ICT infrastructure has produced the sense of a cohesive media public represented by the power of real-time internet searches, shugum, and the belief that media captures the national present in some material form. However, the claim of an integrated media public also fuels speculation about how that imaginary public entity thinks, feels, and desires. The threat presented by crazed netizenry or the digital version of the madness of the crowd is being converted into a form of soft power in the era of an expansion of fandom as a form of cultural citizenship or even civic duty. In K-pop's MO, fandom cultivates soft power against the assumption that soft power is exercised by the state. In Hanyu 2.0, or the social networking uh, fueled globalization of the K-pop market, what the state requires is, in addition to industry cooperation and control, is a kind of populist discourse that can only be produced by individual fans. Thus, K-pop is in its present entanglement in forms of digitally mediated sociality um, that have been alternately labeled digital democracy, communicative capitalism, or the mediatized popular, or mediatized popular democracy, helps us to understand the conceptual limits of a global public defined by mediated affective bonds, as well as the flows of lateral exchange that establish global solidarity by forcing us to address forms of media populism that produce felt community, but that nevertheless affirm self-modification as contents. So, thank you. So, hi everybody. Um, I, I'm coming at this from the perspective of a filmmaker and someone in cinema studies. So, I guess I would start this conversation off with thinking about um, form, and I'm really interested in, in the way in which you, you move from the music video to this larger idea of transmedia and the way there's an entire system built from that original piece uh, and then moves around that. I wonder if you might talk about the, the um, at first that, that original piece and the way in which uh, certain forms um, I mean, to, to me, at some level, it's kind of operating almost as a gift uh, at some level because of the repetition, um, the, the synchronicity, the certain um, dance moves that are then uh, made even more of a spectacle in the way that the cutting has taken place. Uh, how that, at some level, is a compression. There's no narrative. There is very little, at some level, being said or, or happening. Um, I'm curious about your, your thoughts on that just as a defining part of K-pop. That's just a place to start. Um, especially because you referenced just a little bit a couple of other um, Global South films that uh, were perhaps starting points for some of these pieces to come out of. Yeah. Um, so I actually think that um, yeah, the, the comparison between the music video and the GIF is really interesting because in a way, K-pop music videos are so quickly edited and so dense in their mise-en-scene mm -hmm. 
that they are tailor-made for turning into gifs or memes or um, they're aiming for virality which is um, possible through the compression of, of content or signification. I wouldn't say that they're, so, so I did a little bit of a reading of the lyrics and how they try to kind of transcend language by becoming sonic units of rhythm. Um, but I think that also in the kind of density of layering in the music video content, um, you almost have an overabundance of meaning because uh, someone can sort of, the, the, the compression of signifiers is actually intended, I think, to produce a, a sense of familiarity no matter where you're coming at it from, right? So if you love Bollywood, then you'll see it there. If you love American hip hop, then you'll see it there. If you love um, EDM, then you'll see it there too, right? So um, everything is kind of presented in a flash um, so that um, rather than being, um, I think very few, well, hardcore fans will do this kind of like dissection or analysis of the video that really draws out and unfurls the multiple layers of reference. But I think a lot of people who are just watching for entertainment value, they're not doing that, and that's the point, that, that there's this kind of um, intertextuality that doesn't require um, the sort of cult fan um, approach where you really have to dig in order to un un unravel what's happening. Um, I think though that those kind of cult fan um, fandom impulses are also entertained by the industry and that's something that's huge in BTS fandom like we all, if there are BTS fans here you know how much the fandom is engaged in sort of theorizing what's happening and linking together kind of narrative that is actually presented across multiple texts and multiple videos. They're not, they're not contained by one form in a video, but they um, emerge through this transmedia world. So yeah, I think aesthetically, um, what K-pop music videos are trying to do are again to be sort of everything <laughs> um, all at once except maybe for slow cinema, right? That's, that's the opposite <laughs> aesthetic. Um, but so, um, yeah. So in the, I, to follow up on that, then, I'm really curious, like, kind of in this age, at least in the US, I would say, of um, a kind of almost fear of cultural appropriation and uh, a heightening of identity politics, I'm curious how this might be in conversation with that as um, in opposition and a kind of freedom and allowing for that that people are relating to? Totally. I mean, um, so there, I think there are lots of, um, the, the issue of cultural appropriation is quite specific <coughs> in the K-pop industry as well. I think the, um, the video that I chose, I chose specifically because it, um, it deals with it in a way that um, kind of relies on the mixed race status of um, one of the performers, it really kind of links the uh, production of hip-hop in K-pop to a kind of um, authenticating presence um, and also is like pointing to the um, history behind the, um, the integration of U.S. musical forms into South Korea given South Korea's position in the Asia Pacific as part of, you know, U.S. empire. So I think it's because of that historical connection that the same kinds of, um, you know, criticisms of cultural appropriation sometimes have a limit because you're talking about um, a very different kind of, of context and especially one that, um, one where you have to really be attentive to the kind of um, the political, um, the political forces in play, I guess. So, but there is this kind of freedom that's being um, claimed, I guess, by the K-pop performers to pull on cultural reference points from everywhere because of this non-dominant. Like, you know, it's it's different when a hegemonic kind of, when the global hegemon is doing it in a way that um, is uh, extractive. But you could argue that, you know, the Korean pop, industry's relationship to the global south is similarly extractive. Um, and I think that um, 
Yeah, there are discussions of this as well. So there's this kind of, you know, sub-imperial impulse on the part of the South Korean, uh, South Korean industry to, um, um, yeah, exert a place in the hierarchy <coughs> of economic kind of forces or economic power. Well, I also want to back up and just say thank you for the, I mean, the talk is, you have, there's so many points to cover and you've really, you, you've really given us kind of a lot to think about politically, aesthetically, um, culturally, um, cinematically, um, and certainly in the way in which, the, the point at which we are right now, I feel like you've really jumped into 2019 too and given us a, a great picture of, of what's happening with K-pop and how that's come out of K-Wave and, and where we are at this moment in time. Um, I just wonder, this is a little bit of a general question, but if you might comment um, kind of almost from a personal perspective of your research, where you see this going? Mm -hmm. I mean, is this sustainable to have this kind of manipulation of these groups that are so obviously um, expensive and mass industry oriented? Certainly they're making a lot of money right now, um, but I am curious if, if this is a sustainable media form, if, if fans are at some level going to, do you expect at some level there might be a pushback? Is it going to implode and kind of cannibalize itself because it is so reliant? Um, this goes into the soft power conversation on fans you know, giving back. Right, right. I don't know what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Well, I think that because K-pop as an industry has um, really skillfully, I think, um, been able to target its strategies to the kind of everyday media comportment that a lot of people in many places um, are adapting to. So this kind of um, social media, um, just spending a lot of time on social media, social networking sites, um, choosing to kind of follow and consume media that's not necessarily locally produced, but that you are introduced to by other networks, and forging relationships that are mediated that maybe rely less on face-to-face -face contact. Um, I think that um, because K-pop is so adaptable to that kind of media environment, it's um, not gonna go anywhere. <laughs> um, but there is something about um, fandoms at least in North America or outside of the East Asian re region, really um, growing in this environment of um, non-mainstreamness, right? So once K-pop becomes a bit more mainstream in the local market, it might start to lose its shine or lose its appeal as <coughs> an alternative space, right? Um, so I don't know, we may see that, but, um, as from now, I think that the also the industry has been really good at using both this kind of digital space as well as still fostering the kind of in-person, um, you know, live embodied kind of um, events to make the make K-pop fandom into something that's more than just I don't know uh, something that you do when you're typing comments on the YouTube. Page. Right, so that you know, with the um, importance of choreography, people are getting together to actually like, perform dances in public or to do things in um, physical space together. Concerts are really important, right? So, so because K-pop fandom is both this very like live and in-person kind of um, fan community, and the conventions are also really good for that as well as uh, something that people can partake in, even if they're not in a major metropolitan area, that they can <coughs> kind of meet up with other fans. Um, I think that it's especially well suited for, yeah, kind of building on this idea of a youth consciousness, a global youth consciousness. Everybody who's um, affected by kind of post-recession condition can find something that um, connects them to fellow fans. So, I have one more question and then I'll open it up. And that is um, going back to this idea of, of affect and the way in which 
certainly the um, the cutting, the editing, the music itself, uh, and then also the performers are really playing on the, the tactility of being present, whether that's um, you know literally thinking about skin or sounds of of um, skin hitting something else, and then the body moving, yeah. and then the way in which the cutting is happening in relation to that. As you said, it's giving this kind of very distinctive um, entry into uh, a kind of a feeling of connectedness both to the dancer but to oneself and mm -hmm. potentially other people doing that same dance. Um, I mean, I wonder if you might talk about that in conversation with uh, the fact that this is a primarily digitally consumed um, music and form, uh, and if that at some level is maybe having its own kind of dance. Yeah. I mean, I'm really interested in this idea of like mediated liveness. So when people talk about liveness, um, usually you find the term and concept coming up either in performance studies where people are kind of talking about the difference between a live performance that doesn't rely on its um, documentation or the access. Um, so the, the kind of only happening once, the, the um, temporality of liveness. Or you hear about liveness as a a dominant feature of broadcast media, so like television, uh, radio, these are live broadcast forms where it's all about like the um, simultaneity of reception. Like you have the Super Bowl, everyone's watching it live at the same time, and so that kind of connectivity um, is really bound to the presentness in time more than the presentness in uh, space, right? So. Um, what I think is really interesting about the kinds of fan-produced media in response to K-pop that are proliferating the most or that seem to be the most popular is that they try to they try to take both of those kind of affective um, rubrics of liveness and turn them into something that you can access and watch over and over. So I have really interesting, um, uh, some really interesting examples of um, reaction videos that will like perform watching for the first time, or, um, or where fans will watch and then comment below, oh, this takes me back to the first time, right? So it's a kind of capture of that sort of liveness in order to make it, um, and paradoxically, like something that you can store and repeat and um, and relive in a way, um, and so that kind of um, yeah affective quality is um, really always the point of this sort of media, and it's also really um, important in in like reaction videos are all about like the spontaneous bodily response, the kind of inarticulate. It's all about like fangirling or fanboying, whatever um, that word is supposed to mean. But it's really about this kind of um, un, uh, unpremeditated kind of like shock that happens in the body. But also like the eating videos are really all about this kind of bodily sensation. Um, and then I think in the choreography videos, there is so much emphasis on like bodily movement and how it must feel to dance in that way. Um, and so. The tactility or the kind of sensational quality, it's being moved in a way so that you don't have to experience it in person with others. You can talk about how you shared that bodily sensation. And that's, I think, the substitute for um, actually kind of getting together and being able to, to sense this, I don't know, bodily experience. <coughs> for letting me have that as an opening, but uh, I, yeah, I'd love to open it up to um, the whole audience, so if anyone else has questions, please. Um, you used, I think you used the phrase communicative cataclysm. Yeah. Um, but I didn't write, I didn't have a chance to write down what it means. Can you just remind us what that is? Totally, yeah. So um, the term is used by a media critic, um, Jody Dean. And she has a kind of theory of, um, you know, what late stage capitalism entails, and this is the condition that we're in. And um, with these kind of global platforms 
um, our global media um, uh, corporations that rely on um, the production of value through sharing, liking, <coughs> so Facebook, Google, um, Twitter, all of these um, media platforms that are privately owned but rely on users using them in order to generate revenue. This is what she calls communicative capitalism. So it's um, the extraction of value through the act of communication, where um, you know, in the past, in, in like in a pre-digital age, yes, there was print capitalism, where you had um, media forms that were sold as commodities or traded as commodities, like books, like newspapers and magazines. Um, but in this kind of, um, in this climate, it, it's not that communicative capitalism is something kind of separate from or disconnected from print capitalism, but it's an intensification of the production of value through communication. So in her um, use of the concept, she's really kind of, she's kind of pessimistic about it um, because she's looking at the way that politics um, or political discourse has become completely developed, enveloped by this kind of communicative capitalist apparatus so that, you know, um, there isn't a space for people to just come together as you know, citizens and, and assert themselves in a democracy, but they are always media consumers at the same time. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for that great talk. Uh, just, you mentioned, and, and probably in your response to your last question, the corporate, corporate plurality yeah. of essentially what you do when you sit and watch your screen or your phone or, you know, is it just kind of that mundane um, way that we physically interact with the digital world that you're thinking of it, or is there more to it than that? Um, so I started to think about, um, like, why K-pop fans or uh, K-pop fandom is so interested in seeing spectacles of like physical response with um, reaction videos that were produced um, in response to Sai's Gangnam Style, which is a track <laughs> viral video happened in 2012. Um, and so I was really thinking about the corporeality of capable perception as a translation mechanism, right? So for a lot of people who are watching this thing and they're like, what, what is this? You know, I don't know how to, under I don't understand the lyrics. This is all mind-boggling but crazy, you know. It was the show, being able to show how a media text was affecting you physically that made it somehow um, fun to watch for others because then they could sort of get a sense of what it meant, right? If you can't understand the lyrical content of the song, at least you can understand what its significance is as a kind of cultural phenomenon, which is, that it like is funny and bouncy and and people who watch it like collapse into giggles or something like that, right? So it's a meme, right? Um, and so I think I was meaning corporeality in that sense. And then um, so it's, it's it's immediately mediated again, right? Yes, corporeality is feeds right back into the yes, form. absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's corporeality that is performed. Um, not always in an exaggerated way, and people are always, the, the reaction videos that are the most popular are the ones that don't seem uh, contrived, or they, they seem like they're like authentic reactions, um, but nevertheless, they're always like performed for a spectator. Um, but I am really interested too in the kind of everyday corporeality of our relationship to tech, you know? Um, we spend so much of our lives in that space, that third space between like, the real world and then the, the virtual world and you know that um, yeah that is also really interesting. Well, because there's some of that work that kind of focuses on the way digital medias depend on that kind of corporeality. Yes. Really. We always think of it as being kind of very non-corporate. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean um, definitely 
in discussions of like portability, so the devices or like how we are engaging with all this technology that we like carry or, or wear or hold, right? Or, um, so this kind of corporeality. Um, but also the way that, you know, the internet is not this space where you can transcend your subjectivity, <laughs> but it is a space that actually produces a lot of our normative ideas about race, gender, um, I, yeah, who people are, what they need. Um, so towards the end of the talk, you sort of talked about how maybe soft power wasn't maybe as valuable politically as maybe it's sort of talked about in academia sometimes. Like I guess it didn't help like the uh, Green Summit that much. But I guess I'm sort of curious, and to remind me of some of the BTS history, it was sort of the contemporary political issue in South Korea of sort of mandatory military service. Um, did, did the did BTS have to do military service before or after? I guess they, they formed. Their, <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you guys help me out here, so. No, um, they're they're supposed to go to. The Oh, so it's still coming. Yeah, okay, so yeah, I guess that's yeah. sort of my follow-up question here is sort of how maybe you talk about maybe the citizens are building more soft power than the government itself. Like that's got to be generating quite a bit of discourse with the citizens themselves uh, about like you know the value of the continued sort of that mandatory military service. Mm -hmm. so, I'm, so I'm curious maybe where your thoughts are about maybe like um, the coming popular K-pop is maybe generating some more political discourse about things that would have been talked about in the, in the past. Maybe that's sort of you know, soft power of the population. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about how K-pop has been mobilized to support the state, including like the military, because um, at least domestically, the um, you know there are lots of examples of like K-pop idols being um, sent to cheer up the troops, or um, K-pop idols being filmed in a reality TV show, being in the army, you know, to make it seem like cool and fun. Um, like this fun place where you get to just like have have a fun time with your friends, you know. Um, so K-pop idols have definitely been um, mobilized in service of um, managing the public's attitudes about um, the continuation of military service. And also, I mean, K-pop has been used as a propaganda tool, um, like pipe speakers over at the DNC, right? So <laughs> as a way to, um, yeah, I don't know, kind of represent Korean, uh, South Korean uh, development or something, and just sway the hearts and minds of North Koreans or something. Um, but then also, K-pop idols are, are used as a diplomatic tool. <laughs> um, so like, there were K-pop performers <coughs> that went to a concert, performed at a concert in Pyongyang last year. So in all of these different ways, K-pop idols are used um, as national representatives, right? Um, almost as if they are Olympic athletes or something like that. You know, they're, they're uh, national subjects, national servants, uh, public servants. Um, so that's one way in which I think K-pop is used to uh, facilitate hard, what's called hard power in like the political science rhetoric where hard power and soft power are contrasted. I think what I was trying to suggest is that that dichotomy is a little bit uh, unwieldy because the idea that soft power is, um, you know, the way that Joseph and I defined it in US context is that, you know, soft power includes Hollywood and foreign aid, right? It's just the kind of state power that it's exerted not through uh, coercion, but through um, the establishment of cultural hegemony. Um, but I don't know that K-pop is a form of state power necessarily in the way that it's being kind of presented sometimes. So that's, I think, where I have a bit of a uh, disagreement with the concept. Because I don't think K-pop is like foreign aid. <laughs> or it's a, yeah. mm -hmm. that you gave to our questions about liveness. Um, because I think that um, part of the liveness of all of the social media is kind of the stream of reactions, basically, right? 
so there is kind of like an ongoing stream, and in order to maintain the stream, it needs to be constantly refreshed and updated. So there is a kind of rhythm of internet liveness <laughs> that is kind of there. And what this kind of you know makes me think of, and I don't know if you know this uh, media practice. I know it kind of from Chinese and Japanese contexts. But of, you know, I don't know what the proper name of it is in English actually, but just uh, people watching videos and then commenting on the streams, like in this very constant stream of text. Yes. Um, so it's, I think that might be an interesting comparison actually, because it's entirely textual, as opposed to this very bodily um, live reaction that you're talking about. And it can also be looped or, you know, refreshed <laughs> and, it, you know, could constantly uh, accumulated and added to yeah. um, in a way that creates that sort of a different type of co-feeling maybe. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you can kind of speculate, me. I know this is not you know, the content of your <laughs> presentation, but if you could speculate to some of you know, the different affordances of that type of participation Absolutely. versus K-pop, which I think is, um, it seems much more specifically tied to the K-pop idol as commodity. Mm -hmm. That's my intuition, but mm -hmm. maybe you can support it. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. I think there's this, um, definitely liveness, televisual liveness, um, makes a lot of use of on-screen text. And so I've thought about it a lot in terms of, um, you know, the, the variety show aesthetic where text is animated in a weird way to kind of introduce the voice of a participating viewer or someone outside of the image. Um, but the textual aesthetics that you're talking about, the kind of um, accumulation of responses that sometimes cover over, like on Nico Nico, right? The, right, right, right. They can cover over the entire image, so all you have is like the, the comments, feeds. That's being incorporated into platforms like DLive. Um, there, you can see the, the live commentary. It doesn't obscure the image in the same way, but um, that too, you can like turn it on if you want to watch it, or turn it off if you are not into it. So there's also this adaptability that's built in for audiences who are coming from different media regions um, with different kinds of expectations. Um, but I think that it's also, um, yeah, the, the, the corporeal liveness and textual liveness, um, I think they get kind of married together in a really interesting way, and so, um, that's definitely something that I'm, I'm very interested in also looking at because um, it's also a space where you can see different um, like media worlds coming together, right? So if in, like on Instagram live feeds now, there are also like scrolling comments. Um, this is something that um, is relatively recent, I think. Um, but even having the live streaming cap capacity of YouTube or Instagram um, that's something that is belated, right? It started after this was possible with other media platforms in Asia. Just to comment on that, though, I think that moves it away from the cosmopolitan or the you know kind of larger global possibilities of what K-pop offers, because suddenly you become okay. Can I read Mandarin, or am I you know can I read this? What language is it in? Does that alienate me or include me? Um, or do, the, do they split into different channels? So. It's different different scripts all kind of together. Right. No, yeah. no, I know. I just mean like as a viewer, when it's more when it's more bodily and it's more visual, mm -hmm. it doesn't introduce that possibility right. of a needing to you know, either ignore certain things or not. Right. right. And then it becomes more of its own sort of online commented language, right? Which forms the community. Exactly. Whereas this, what you're talking about is like, you know, it's trying to grab everything together so you can't make those linguistic divisions <laughs> or else you're in trouble. Yeah, I think that's a question about, um, about BTS. I'm so curious about how many of them there are. <laughs> and um, this idea of you know, how big will the, the groups get, uh, how many idols can be contained within a single unit, and this idea of, okay, the, the more there are, does that mean the more, you know, is that translating into the more people that are relating to different people as a group? I don't know, that multiplicity of identities that then sprouts out of 
a group seems to be then tied to a certain group. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there are seven members, <laughs> and um, they're, they're like a medium-sized idol group at this point. There are groups that have many more members, and I think the primary reason for that is choreography. Yeah. Because multiple bodies doing things in coordination is always very impressive as a spectacle. Um, but K-pop, like, in contrast to J-pop, um, has fixed members that aren't necessarily substitutable in and out, whereas J-pop has a modular form, which is something that, uh, so you can have, like, AKB48 is a famous example, mm -hmm. and you have um, AKB, for, AKB groups in different cities, and so there are 300 AKB48 members that all operate in these like live performance uh, groups, and they rotate in and out based on like aging, you know, <laughs> taking on different things in their careers. So that's a model that so far I think Korean groups and fans of Korean groups don't like. So, um, but that's also what the NCT group is trying to emulate. So, um, so yeah, the size is very again. It's tied to like what sort of spectacle you want to mount. Um, so there's like 13 member groups, you know, um, bigger ones. But also it offers a variety of different personas within a group that will be the favorite of lots of different people. So you're kind of allowing the idol to turn into a character, which is really interesting. And then people get um, particularly invested in, in one character or 